because I've actually done a lot of work on U.S. pensions. I'm sure you don't want to hear about uh, the U.S. pension system, but we have many of the pro same problems as um, he was discussing. What I'm going to do is first set the stage by taking a step back and looking at the way modern money systems operate and then at how you might think about approaching retirement in a completely different way than using private uh, pension plans. So first, a very quick review of what Stephanie was presenting earlier, modern money approach. Now, I, much of what I'm gonna say applies strictly to a government that issues a sovereign currency, its own currency, and that doesn't promise to convert it to either gold or to foreign currencies at a fixed exchange rate. So floating exchange rate is important to give you full domestic policy space. If you peg to a foreign currency or if you go the whole hog like Ireland did and you adopt somebody else's currency, a foreign currency like the Euro, your policy space is more constrained, okay? But um, you still do have some room to move. And much of what I'm gonna say actually still does apply even to you. For example, it still is true that your government spends by crediting bank accounts of the recipients who are either selling goods or services to the government or who are receiving transfer payments, for example, social security payments. The way that the government actually makes the payment is by crediting your bank account and crediting your bank's reserves at the central bank. This is not a policy proposal. This is a description of the way it actually works. And if you've got someone from your treasury or central bank who actually does these operations, they would tell you this is true. This is the way it's done, okay? Um, the uh, government taxes by debiting your bank accounts. It simply reduces the amount in your checking account at your bank and it reduces your bank's reserves at the central bank. This is the way taxes are paid. Where do the taxes go? They're just deducted from accounts. Okay, they don't go anywhere. Government does not spend tax revenue. In fact, it cannot do that. Okay. The central bank sets the overnight interest rate target. Now, I realize that you're very constrained because you uh, have adopted a foreign central bank, the ECB, that is um, doing this. But then it adds and drains bank reserves in order to hit that overnight rate target. Again, this is a description. It's not a policy proposal. This is the way that central banks hit their overnight interest rate targets. Now, the policy recommendation that we make is that um, governments should remove whatever operational and political constraints they have put on the spending and taxing and bond sale uh, uh, processes. Okay, for example, a balanced budget requirement. A country with a modern currency, its own sovereign currency that floats the currency, can adopt a balanced budget amendment. We actually have one in the United States. Okay, we're saying it's silly. We, of course, have a debt limit, and you probably have heard about this huge debate in the U.S., should we raise the debt limit? Okay, this is not a market-imposed debt limit. Congress imposes a debt limit on its government. Okay, we're saying, get rid of it. Why have this silly debate? Okay, the market is perfectly happy to take more U.S. dollars and, and more Treasury bonds if the Treasury chooses to sell them. It's a self-imposed constraint. Remove it, okay? Um, uh, much more important uh, uh, constraint that countries adopt is a fixed exchange rate, okay, which you have in the most extreme form possible. But many countries around the world adopt some form of fixed exchange rate system, pegging to the dollar or to the euro or something else. That will constrain their ability to use fiscal and monetary policy to conduct their domestic economies in a manner that is conducive to economic development to supporting the aged, which is the topic now, for example, supporting the young, providing health care and education and so on. So this again, this is a self-imposed constraint that should be abandoned. Uh, and finally, the, the belief that markets determine your interest rate in some way, this is um, completely false. Now governments do face a real constraint and that is full employment. 
up to full employment, if there are unemployed resources out there, the government can always afford to hire them, to buy them, okay? If there are unemployed resources, the government can always afford to buy them. How? By crediting bank accounts of the sellers. If there's unemployed labor out there, the government can always afford to put it to use. Now, I want to move into a different topic, and it, it may not be obvious yet why this is related to taking care of the aged, okay, but it is. Um, Stephanie uh, started to go through uh, the national balances, so let me just back up a little bit, and let's um, say there are only two people in your economy. There are only two. The only way that one can spend less than its income is if the other spends more than her income. Okay? For every economic entity that spends less than its income, there must be another that spends more than its income because at the aggregate level, spending and income have to balance. Okay? Spending and income have to balance. If you spend, someone has got income. If someone spends, you've got income. At the aggregate level, they must balance. This is an identity, an accounting identity. It's not a proposal, it's not a theory. It must be true by definition, okay? One sector in your economy can spend more than its income only if another sector spends less than its income. The deficit of one sector equals the surplus of another. The surplus of a sector leads to net accumulation of financial claims on the other sector, the sector that is running a deficit. This is true by identity, okay? Surplus, we could say, is the accounting record of the deficit. The surplus received by one sector is the accounting record of the deficit run by the other sector. Financial wealth, the accumulation of financial assets, is, a, is an accumulation of claims on the deficit sector. So financial wealth equals the financial debt, okay? which is the accumulation of the deficits run over every period. Okay, so let's look at what is a government deficit. The government purchases goods and services and makes transfers by crediting bank accounts, as I already talked about. Taxpayers pay taxes, which means the government debits their bank accounts. If government spending, G, is greater than tax revenue, T, it, we call it a government deficit. What is it? It means the non-government sector has received more income from the government than it is paid in taxes to the government. It is running a surplus. The government deficit is a non-government sector surplus by identity. This has to be true, okay? The surplus run by the non-government sector is accumulated in the form of claims on the government, the government's liabilities, okay? That is net financial saving for the non-government sector saving in the form of financial claims on the government, okay? A government debt is equal to the non-government's net financial wealth. That is what government debt is. It's the non-government sector's net financial wealth. Probably some of you have heard that we have a, a, a debt clock on Times Square and the numbers spin so fast you can barely see it. It should be called National Wealth Clock. That's what it is. It's a measure of the financial wealth held by the non-government sector. Now it's true, a lot of that is held around the rest of the world. The US provides the international reserve currency. The rest of the world wants to accumulate that wealth and we're allowing them to do that, okay? So the uh, Times Square clock is keeping track of that too. Now let's look at the difference between what we call inside wealth and outside wealth. Inside wealth is just within the non-government sector. Of course, you might owe your neighbor, okay? Your neighbor has a claim on you, but when we add up all the households together and all the firms together, the inside wealth of the non-government sector has to net to zero. For every asset, there's a liability, okay? Your neighbor's IOU to you is your wealth, but it's their debt. They cancel, okay? So the um, sum of non-government financial wealth has to be zero. 
It's impossible for a society to save for the future in financial terms using inside wealth because it all nets to zero. For every asset, there's an offsetting liability. There is no net saving in the private sector of financial claims on the private sector, okay? Inside non-government net wealth is only the real assets, not the financial. So you can save in real terms for the future. You can dig holes in your backyard and you can bury automobiles and so on that you can dig up later and try to drive them, okay? But you cannot net financially save for the future. In the only way that the private sector can save for the future is in real terms, the real stuff you've accumulated. Now, of course, digging holes for automobiles is not a good idea. On the other hand, building bridges that are going to last 50 years is a good idea. That is a way to save for the future. Only the government is a source of net financial assets. The government is the only source of net financial assets for the non-government sector. Government deficits lead to an increase of net financial wealth. Government surpluses reduce net financial wealth. Government surpluses mean you're reducing the non-government sector's wealth. That is why it is so devastating for economies to run budget surpluses. Because a government budget surplus means you're reducing the private sector's income and reducing their accumulation of financial wealth. This usually has very bad consequences, okay? Government debt <coughs> cannot burden future generations. You hear all the time that running up government debt is gonna burden our grandkids. Of course it's not. It's gonna leave them with financial wealth, okay? Government debt is financial wealth for the private sector. We will leave our grandkids an inheritance of treasury bonds. This is not a bad thing. Okay, summary, as Stephanie said. We generally divide the economy up into three sectors, okay? We have a non-government domestic sector, the inside net financial wealth created in our non-government domestic sector is zero. For every asset, there's a liability. The non-government net financial wealth created annually is equal to the government's deficit, okay? Now that's in our two sector economy. Once we move to a three sector that also has an external or foreign sector, the rest of the world's net financial wealth created annually will be equal to the current account deficit. The current account is a little broader than trade and goods and services because it includes factor payments, profits and interest that flow, okay? The, um, rest of the world's net financial wealth created annually will be equal to the current account deficit of the country that's the issuer of the currency, which is also equal to what's called the capital account surplus. The capital account surplus is the offset to a current account deficit, okay? Now, this is a little abstract, so let's um, look at a case. These are, are, are uh, numbers that I got off the web this morning. Let's hope that they're correct. I can't vouch for them because I don't know the Ireland's um, situation. At the aggregate level, we know that the sum of the balances across the three sectors has to be zero, okay? So you have a government balance, you have a capital account balance, which is the financial flows that are the counterpart to your current account balance, and you have a private sec domestic private sector balance, okay? The sum has to be zero. In 2006, you had a government budget surplus of 5.7% of GDP. You had a current account balance of 3.6%, sorry, that's capital account balance, capital account balance of 3.6% of GDP. That meant you had a current account deficit, capital account surplus, 3.6% of GDP. And you had a private sector balance of negative 9.3%. What does that mean? Your private sector was spending more than its income. Your government sector was spending less than its income. Okay? The government was accumulating claims on the private sector. They're reducing your wealth. 
The government was reducing your net wealth. Uh-oh, you went into a financial crisis. Well, so did the U.S. At when uh, the Clinton administration ran a budget surplus in the 1990, late 1990s, for two and a half years, we ran a budget surplus very similar to your government's budget surplus, and we went into a recession. Okay. Anyway, in 2010, the government balance was now negative, 23.5%. So this is your budget deficit. You still had a capital account balance of 2.7%. So your private sector now has a positive balance of 21%. What that means is it's spending far less than its income. Why? Because it's scared out of its mind, right? So nobody wants to spend accumulating claims. What kind of claims are you accumulating? Claims on your government. Your government's budget deficit is allowing the private sector to save, okay? Which is what the private sector wants to do. For the U.S., this is the same picture that um, Stephanie showed. I won't go through it in detail, but what I wanted to point out one thing that maybe it wasn't obvious to you. Does it look like a mirror image? It's a mirror image. Why is it a mirror image? Because it has to net to zero. It's got a balance. Everything above the line has to have a counterpart below the line. The normal situation for almost all countries is a budget deficit. That's the normal situation. Why? Because your domestic private sector likes to save. They like to accumulate financial assets. You want to put your kids through college, so you save. You want to save for your retirement. The private sector wants to have a positive surplus. That means your government needs to run a budget deficit. Budget deficits are absolutely normal. It's the way that the government provides net financial saving to the private sector. Now, the only exception is, of course, there is a third sector. If you can run big, um, trade surpluses against the rest of the world, you can accumulate claims on the rest of the world. Okay, your private sector can run a surplus by accumulating claims on the rest of the world. You know, that's the Chinese strategy. They've accumulated almost three trillion dollars of claims on the United States. That's the form that most of their saving is taking. Okay, but most countries can't do that and we certainly, we all can't be net exporters. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to point this out because I, I love this. This is the, the Wall Street Journal, June 29th, 1999. On the left-hand side, some of you will remember when uh, Clinton went on TV and announced we've achieved a budget surplus, a record budget surplus. The last time we ran a budget surplus this big was back in 1929. Does the date <laughs> ring a bell? 1929. And we're going to run budget surpluses for the next 15 years. The government is adding to national saving, and we're going to retire all the government debt. Okay, that's the left-hand column. Right-hand column. The private sector is not saving anymore. They're spending more than their income. This is terrible. We need the private sector to increase its saving. Okay, they even have a nice chart in the middle that shows the two crossing. Neither article links the two together. It's an identity, folks. <laughs> if the government is spending less than its income, households have to be spending more than theirs. We can't all be savers. Someone has to be deficit spending, and it was the private sector. And of course, Clinton was wrong. In fact, this, we had one more year of budget surpluses. We went into a deep recession, and we got budget deficits. We returned to budget deficits, okay? Okay. Um, policy implications for sovereign currency. Government cannot go bankrupt in its own sovereign floating currency. The government can always afford to buy anything for sale in its own currency. The only economic constraints government faces are full employment resources and possibly inflation even before you get to full employment resources. And so you might want to do something about that. All the other constraints on a sovereign government are political self-imposed. Now, very quickly, what happened is that in the post-war period, we had the creation of a new form of capitalism that my professor Hyman Minsky, maybe you've heard his name, uh, it's called the Minsky Crisis, the Minsky Moment, uh, 2007. Um, Minsky started writing about this new form of capitalism that was going to 
lead to the possibility of another 1930s style Great Depression and debt deflation process. He called it money manager capitalism. Other people noticed this. They called it financialization. Okay. Uh, anyway, it, it just very briefly, it's characterized by the rise of huge pools of managed money with money managers that have to get high returns. Every money manager has to be above average or they lose their job. Okay. The only way you can be above average is to take big risks. Okay. And so that is exactly what they're doing. Minsky, this is going to destabilize the economy and we're going to have a global financial crisis, which we had in 2007. Okay. For every financial asset, there's a financial liability in the United States. The total financial liabilities are five times GDP. The rough calculation for Ireland looks like you are 10 times GDP. Okay. So you are heavily financialized and even more so than the United States. Pension funds are part of money manager capitalism. Not only are they victims of the crisis because they lost tremendous amounts in the United States, 40% of pension funds were lost in the global financial crisis. They created the global financial crisis. They are part of managed money seeking the high returns and taking the risks that led to the crisis. They're so big that they move any market that they go into. We heard about commodities this morning. What drove up commodities prices? U.S. pension funds, both times. 2008, why did the gasoline price fall from, or oil price fall from $149 to $49 a barrel? U.S. pension funds pulled one third of their money out and it collapsed. U.S. pension funds are going to withdraw from commodities markets. Okay, in fact, they probably have just started. Prices are going to collapse. That's what happens when you have huge pools of managed money that find an asset class and move in, and they drive the price up until they decide to get out, and then it will collapse. Managed money as a whole is too large. It's become too big, okay? Um, and it will destabilize any financial market it goes into. Pension fund strategy, I already mentioned this, they need the risk to get the high returns. Now the problem is that high returns on risky assets only compensate you for the risk. And so actually, and I deal with this in a very long paper at the Levy Institute you read about, there's no reason to believe that taking the risk actually does lead to risk adjusted higher returns. Actually, you can get just as good returns out of safe, sovereign government debt. And so my argument is that the pension funds should be forced to move into safe government debt. What's an alternative public policy strategy? Okay, we have promoted U.S. pension funds in the United States. They are now 75% of GDP well before the crisis but they're probably back close to that now. Um, it's a huge industry that owes its existence to favorable treatment by the government. They have tax advantages and they have a government guarantee standing behind them in the form of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Workers would be far better off and the economy would be far better off if we removed all of the government advantages and required them to invest in treasuries. So that would be the best uh, solution for them. If we're going to be downsizing pension funds and downsizing the prospective returns of pension funds, we need an alternative to ensure that elderly people, retired people, get a decent retirement. What we need to do is ramp up Social Security to replace private pension plans. Okay? What is Social Security? And I'm just about there. <laughs> uh, it's a national government program. It cannot become solvent, insolvent if the government is sovereign because the government will always be able to make all of the benefit payments as they come due. How? By crediting bank accounts. Government can never run out of funds. It can always credit the accounts of the recipients. What is Social Security really? It's an intergenerational promise. It says that workers today are providing for elderlies today. Not providing for elderly in the future, providing for them today. How? By producing goods and services for them to use. Okay? So it's an intergenerational promise. Then we promise the workers today that in the future there will be workers that take care of them. 
So really that is what Social Security is all about. Advance funding for a government Social Security program is not only undesirable, it's impossible. There is no way to financially fund spending in the future. In the future, the government will make Social Security payments by crediting bank accounts, not out of accumulated trust funds like we have in the United States. It's pure nonsense. Cannot be done that way. It's impossible for society as a whole to save financially. I already um, talked about that. Individuals can do it. Society cannot. Government cannot. Provision for the future is through real investments, education, health, infrastructure, and natural resources. Taxes tomorrow don't pay for Social Security tomorrow. What they do is they prevent the workers of that generation from buying up all the output. You take away some of their income to make sure some of the output is left for the elderly tomorrow. Conclusion. So the crisis has brought home the vulnerability of excessive financialization and private pension plans are part of the financialization of the economy. The longer term trends mean that even without financial crises, the financialized pension system is highly problematic. Aging is going to produce more financial claims okay, on future output that will come from fewer workers. All societies are aging. Only a couple of, uh, of exceptions in sub-Saharan Africa. Every other economy on Earth is aging very rapidly. Saving now in order to provide for your retirement in the future just reduces spending and creates unemployment. Managed money destabilizes financial markets. We talked about commodities, land, health care in the United States. Obamacare is nothing but financialization of health care. That's what it is. Uh, peasant insurance, if you've heard about that, death, death settlements, all of these things are financialization of death, you know, the ultimate. Uh, it doesn't automatically increase ability to, to provision in any case. We need a strengthened Social Security program with a government guarantee that stands behind the promised benefits. It's an intergenerational promise that will be met as long as our productive to produce, to take care of young worker and aged of the next generations. So what really matters is the ability to produce, to care for everyone. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Randall. It sort of leads in uh, with some of the things I'll be saying. Um, we all carry with us a view of the world, and that view is shaped by our past experience. And often that view contains unacknowledged things, attitudes and opinions, and it reflects a level of, of habituation to what has gone before. And because of that, especially in times where there might be significant change, we barely realize why we are vulnerable. So that is the broad theme for what I'm going to say. But we'll start on pensions. Now, in the end, what we are concerned about is our welfare in the future. Not money or earnings or investment returns. We care about food, shelter, security, and because we have become habituated to more and more stuff, we also might expect, for instance, a cruise or whatever those pictures are of glamorous couples when they try to get you to invest in a pension. Pensions are a modern phenomenon. They are, Otto von Bismarck was the originator. Um, and what we have done is that they are, they are part of a modern economy in the sense that for most of us in our history, we lived close to family relations 
and there was intergenerational bonds and community bonds, and there was an expectation and a social obligation of looking after one's parents, as indeed your children would look after you. Uh, the finan now what we do, by and large, is we, as has been said, we dump things into financial markets as a way of saving or preparing for the future. And what we really want, I reiterate, is real goods and services in that future. So there are currently, in the general sense, said to be concerns about underfunding and demographic changes within our pension. But I would like to look at something else which I think is far more important. But in order to do that, um, I just want to say a few things about what financial assets and our expectations imply. Mostly we expect, on average, over the global economy, that economies will continue to grow over the whole. So our equities valuations, if we're spending a uh, price earnings ratio of 15, that is a level of confidence in the future growth of those companies. Likewise, if we continue to service debt in real terms, we are making a call on the future growth in real goods and services. And here you have some data from Irish pensions. We're quite heavy relative to many other investors in pensions and equities, as you can see. But there is also something else that we take for granted, which is what we might call the operational fabric. We assume that, in whatever future that is, we will have food security. We will have infrastructure. Our supply chains will work. Our monetary system will be stable. And global discretionary income, because that allows you know, the economies of scale that keeps the global economy running. They haven't really been challenged not in the developed world, but I would say they are about to be. But let's just look at macro system stability in the global economy. Now, when I refer to the globalized economy, I'm talking about it as a singular evolving thing, almost living. There are other analogies with living things as well. It's self-organized. Nobody controls the global economy. Each individual company, group, country acts within a myriad constraints, and what emerges is macro system stability and order, like the birds in flight you see in the picture. It has been growth adaptive. For 200 years, we have had, on average, globalizing growth of about 3% per annum over the whole economy. And if you're looking at dynamical systems, you say, this is very interesting. All about 3% there with over 200 years. And people go lunatic mad if it just goes 5% more or 5% below. That's a very narrow range of stability. And we have adapted to the things that that implies. Our economies have been delocalizing and integrating globally. So once my local bread was learned well, it was got locally. It would have taken a big part of my time or income and, you know, easily, re relatively, uh, you know, bought, got locally a big part of my time and income. Now, my local bread is cheap and it costs virtually none of my time, none of my income, but it rests on this vast interconnected system of supply chains telecommunications networks, transport systems, uh, monetary stability that hangs it all together, that crisscross the world. And it requires the economies of scale, the surplus income in the world, to pay for those things. Because if it was just applying for our telecommunications for just people in Ireland while the rest of the world had nothing like it, you know, well, we couldn't afford it. We need all of these people buying their individual elements. It's increasing in complexity. Let me give you an example. Um, and you often see these things when systems fail. A few depot blockades in Britain in 2000, or following the terrible tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Um, well, you'll know probably that supply chains were disrupted. 
especially in those companies producing some of the most complex things, understandably for various reasons. That lets us think that, well, a modern car manufacturer puts together excluding people and the actual ordinary operational infrastructure of the business, but just putting things together, puts together about 15,000 components. And if we imagine that each one of those suppliers, from microchips to screws, puts together 1,500 components, so it's less complex. And let's say one more step, each one of those puts together 1,500 components. How many financial transactions in just that little slide. 47 billion. That's beyond organizing. That's what we mean by self-organization. And why does something so complex hang together? Because we assume monetary stability. We assume, well, there has to be electric grids working all across the world. There has to be shipping systems, a whole myriad of things hanging together. And that's the remarkable stability we've been living with. And part of the result of that is increasing codependence of different elements within systems and increasing production flow rates. So just in time delivery, if we shut our ports in Ireland and our flights today, in two or three days we will have a food security crisis in the country. When the volcano in Iceland went, Within days, th three production lines in Germany for BMW shut down. They couldn't get supplies. We're used to it. We're used to open supply chains, and companies have adapted. That increasing production flow rate means we don't carry inventories of food at home, etc., like our grandparents would have considered probably pretty normal. So this is a general view of macro-system stability. And in this view, the Irish economy does not exist. At a fundamental lesson, it lives and exists by virtue of its integration with the globalized economy. The same is true as the US economy, the German economy, or any other one. And in that way, we can see it, the global economy, like a person. With different countries and their different things, like a heart or a lung, they cannot declare independence and continue their functionality. They exist together. Now, I'll just see one or two little examples of this. We can see it in occupation, energy, and food. Here is the census in 1911, and it's the UK data I have here that I've been able to put together. In 1911, we did physical labor and domestic service. We did agriculture, which is energy for humans. And we did coal mining, energy for development, industry, civilization. Now, we are creatures of a more complex world. We're middle managers, sales personnel, and because we require much many more skills to live in an increasingly complex world, we are teachers. And what has happened, of course, is the things that were non-discretionary and most important, like food or like basic energy services, were once took a lot of our income. And as economies grew on the back of fossil fuels, food prices fell, more and more people were involved. We freed up a huge amount of free spending in the economy for non-discretionary goods and services. We spread them over the globe, and we found ourselves in more and more complex niches. And now we just spend a little on food. But in the end, food, shelter, and these things are primary requirements. And we've let our infrastructure get more and more into People only realized the level of infrastructure interdependency in the last, really following the attacks in the United States in 2001. But if I want to take out the financial system, um, I could always cut the grid, or I could cut the water that relies, requires the grid to go, work, IT networks, etc. So this is almost a singular system. <coughs> And it doesn't require, when people talk about energy, because that's often what we focus on, actually there are whole production flows. Because the more and more complex the system is, the greater its rate of decay. That's the laws of thermodynamics, or in economic terms, you might see it as depreciation. So there is always 
flows, production flows required to maintain the things we depend upon. Over the whole globe, we might see a whole level of what we might term the things that hold it all together, that provide our welfare in a delocalized, complex world. Critical infrastructure, behavioral adaption, institutions of trust, production flows, economies of scale, energy and resource flows, monetary stability, and intermediation. And when they hang together, this whole complex world sings without the controller. It's an amazing thing. Now, the problem is that is at severe risk. And what we describe as that growing, complexifying thing is a thermodynamic system. It's like many living systems, and effectively it is a living system. Now, if we compare it again with the body, my energy system and yours is food. We eat, and it keeps us, allows us to think, move, and all of that. Whereas our global economy takes in fossil fuels and other material resources that are low in entropy, and we spew out heat and waste. But the difference is, unlike uh, ourselves, where when we hit 17 or 18, or we stop growing and our, our food flows and resource flows level off, our global economy is adapted to growth. And that means rising energy flows. And we have become adaptive to particular vectors of flows, their particular um, uh, characteristics. We have a huge invested infrastructure in particular types of things, from cars to uh, our settlement patterns, etc. And uh, we seem to be uh, effectively peak oil now. If you disagree with it, I would say, because people say, oh, technology, of course, technology is part of what a complex globalizing society does too. If you disagree with it, I would put it in <coughs> risk management terms. And if you gather all the experts together who are competent to publish this data and say, what is the average view, you'll find we're at 40, 50 percent of probability on all of those views that we're there now or that we've passed it. We're already finding constraints in food, but because our food production is effectively being put on a fossil fuel platform, once peak oil, once decline sets in, we will uh, have real problems, increased problems with food. Now, energy, food, they are the base of the pyramid that allows or keeps our welfare. We only pay a little bit. That allows us all the complex world we live in. It also hits of those different things that support our welfare on a global scale, something that's already highly unstable. Our credit system and imbalances. If credit is supposed to be in real terms, a call on future wealth, our claims about what we can draw down about the future have been increasing. And so there we have it in 2009. Um, over the whole world, 182%. Um, uh, five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Um, reduced energy flows. Actually, <coughs> when people look at peak oil graphs, they often get them wrong. Here is a toy model. A gap opens up between what we need. So if the IMF is saying that we're going to have, uh, I think, 4 4.5% four growth for the next five years globally, if you use their own figures for elasticities, it means we're going to have to produce 17 million barrels of new oil in the next five years, when we've been flat for the last six. It isn't a hope in hell. Also, there's net energy, but also even producing that requires a huge amount of stability. It requires that we can afford oil, etc. Actually, you start a feedback process that's deeply destabilizing. For financial assets, it means debt cannot be serviced even now in real terms. The global banking system is now effectively insolvent. We will have more and more debt deflationary spirals, etc. Uh, a rapid decline in discretionary income. We, need, we respond to food, etc., energy quicker. Global banking contagion. My real fear is that if there is a global systemic banking collapse, which I think effectively is being probed all the time, 
N is that if it leads to supply chain contagion, we will not be able to recover a lot of the economy. Rising monetary opaqueness, that's risks of firstly deflation, but then we start currency reissuing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now remember that poised global economy with all of that trade. We need to know that our money is some way stable. That's what allowed us and adapted us to where we are. Tiny exit window, as Richard mentioned earlier, to get our assets out, and our pensions, etc., are doomed as they are in terms of financial assets. Uh, governments are likely like to be prepared. And it's not even a question of just credit in the economy. They all become unstable. They all start hitting each other in a series of feedbacks and by back and forths. And you can have very, very serious and fast risks. We're 100% invested in one view of the future. It's untenable. By habituation, our dependencies, thus vulnerabilities, are obscured. What we do in the final day, what do we do in the final days of macro system stability, which we have now? Well, I'm effectively sort of saying we get into resilient investments. What was said earlier, it is about core assets, real assets, localization, social capital. You can read them there I'm rushing through. Um, <coughs> but you'll see that sort of definition. Um, and here are some investment considerations. Basically, you better do it now because anybody's timing trying to get out of this. And there are financial firms that are quite aware of this, and there are talks in some governments. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I think I'll leave it at that, and uh, probably have time for talking later. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, what I'm going to talk about is based on work that TASC has done with the um, Trinity College Pension Policy Research Group, and we've been working with them since 2008 in developing <coughs> a, a new pension model effectively. Um, we updated our policy at, at the beginning of last year, and we work on it on an ongoing basis in terms of looking at um, what government policy is, 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 is coming out and saying in relation to, to pensions and seeing if there's any, any improvement in, in, in for all of us as, as, we, as we get older and face into retirement. Just a couple of things I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the context um, in Ireland in relation to pensions. I'm going to just highlight a couple of the recent developments in government, in government policy. And then I'm going to talk about, and, and I suppose what we would identify as the, as the gaps and, and issues that need to be addressed. And with, with that in mind, talk about the, the model that TASC has developed with Trinity and how some of these gaps we think can, can be filled and policy can be made, made better. So first of all, the context is the fact that in Ireland, um, pension policy combines public and private provision. So it's a, it's a mixture of both. Most people depend on the state pension for an income in retirement. And that costs about almost four and a half billion in, in, in 2010. And if you look at um, increases in the state pension, especially during the boom years, there was a direct correlation between that and reduction in, in, in pensioner poverty during the early part of, of this century. However, despite the recent the gains that were made during the boom, Ireland does not compare well um, with other, Europe, other OECD countries. And the most recent um, work from the OECD has us as one of the lowest, um, have, we have one of the lowest rates of replacement income in retirement in the OECD, we're in the, we're in the bottom four. And we actually top the OECD in terms of um, income poverty for pensioners. Um, that's using the OECD measure of, of less than 50% of median income. So we, in spite of the boom and the gains that were made, we, we still perform very badly in terms of um, income poverty for older people and also in terms of the, the, the level of income you have when you retire. It's, it's less than, than 30%. So just looking at how um, pension take-up is incentivised, the primary driver is, uh, is tax reliefs, tax breaks, whatever you want to call it. And they've been estimated at about three billion um, in 2008. Now they would have been reduced um, as unemployment increases and people that can't afford to, to keep up their pension contributions, um, that, that will have reduced. I think the latest estimate is between two and two and a half billion, but it's still an ex a significant amount of, 
of um, state subsidy to private provision of, of pensions. Um, 80 percent of those tax reliefs accrue to the top 20 percent of earners. So there's huge inequity in that system of incentivization. Um, pension tax reliefs, they're costly, as you can see from how much they cost. They're inefficient because they actually fail to do what they're supposed to do. And they contribute hugely to income inequality in retirement. As Jerry said in the opener, that um, the current policy suits high earners very well. Um, but the people who are on low incomes or who have a um, patchy work history, they, they are the people who actually um, suffer most. In terms of um, if you're a private sector worker, there's, there's blanket pension coverage because it's, it's a mandatory system. <coughs> At the moment, 49% um, of all private sector workers don't have a private pension. And actually pension coverage is falling from 56% in 2005 to 51% in, in 2009. And a recent um, survey, public opinion survey, um, identified 75, three quarters of Irish workers are worried about not having enough money to retire on um, in, in old age. And another, another stat that came out with was that half of all workers were worried about job security. So it puts it in context that more people are worried about their income and their future than, than job security now in a time of crisis. So that, that puts it in context. Also, when you look at um, Irish pensions, they were the worst performer in the uh, OECD in 2008. They lost over a third of their value. Um, so in terms of the private pension scheme, the way the, way the system works, they don't offer security. 75% um, of all defined benefit schemes are, were in deficit, and that actually figure has risen. And interesting, Interestingly, the pension boards last year, the pension board, which is responsible for, for overseeing the pension industry, identified um, private providers as, as engaging in risky behaviour. Now, this was two years after Irish pension funds were the worst performers in the OECD. And I suppose it could be argued that they were engaging in risky behaviour to try and make back some of the gains that they lost at the crisis. But it, it shows in terms of the whole, you know, in terms of the investment, I know Randy talked about that, that this, the way it's invested is, 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 is not conducive to providing a, a stable and secure income in, in retirement. There's then there's also the issue of, of fees and the lack of transparency on charges, a situation whereby regardless of how well your pension performs or not, that the provider gets the same fee. Um, and anyone who's ever got a, a pension statement, it is very difficult to ascertain from your pension statement how much they're actually charging to administer your pension fund. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in relation to uh, current policy on, on pension provision. Last year, the, the government launched the National Pensions Framework, which really was to set out um, a pensions policy for the, for, the, for the coming decades. There's a couple of things that, that are important. One is that they, they, they highlighted the importance of the state pension, which I said earlier, is most people's, that's what most people depend on in retirement, and committed to sustain the value of it at 35% of average earnings. It also set out a move to total contributions, whereby the level of contributions will be increased and include credits for home duties. A lot of women were, are, are disadvantaged to the current system, whereby it's only on the basis of, of, of earned income. There, however, there's no move to universality, which really disadvantages pensioners on non-contributory means-tested pensioners. And there's lots of research to show that um, women in particular are disadvantaged by this system. And then also, we have um, policy in place to increase retirement age from 65 to 68 over the coming years. Now, while if you're an office worker at 65, think working for a couple of extra years mightn't be such a big, a, a big issue, but if you're someone who's a carpenter, if you're a nurse, if you're, if you're working in a physical, a physical um, employment, you could end up not being able to work and not being eligible for a pension. So there's issues there in terms of poverty traps that increasing the pension age will, will, will give rise to. The pensions, National Pensions Framework recognised the need for a supplementary pension and it identifies the pre-RSI, that's our social insurance system, as low cost, easy to understand and secure. They've also set out the contributions level at 8% collected through the PSRI system, but that is too low. All the research shows that it needs to be at least double that to have, a, to, to, to have any sort of a, a, a stable income in, in retirement. 
Also, the National Pensions Framework includes a system of auto-enrolment. So everyone who's, a, who's an employee will be auto-enrolled and that then they would tender out the management of these funds to, pri to pension provide, pen private pension providers. However, there's no uh, plans to, to include a public option and I'll be talking about that in relation to our, our proposals. Um, that it's, 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 it's really rewarding bad behaviour by, uh, by um, basically tendering, allowing the, uh, just to, private providers to tender for, for, for the management of, of these funds. There's also no guarantee um, on investment returns, so there's no, there's no security of income in, in retirement on the basis of, of current, current policy. Now, with the change in government, there's been, obviously, we have a new programme for government, and what they've stated in relation to pensions was that they will reform the pension system to progressively achieve universal coverage with particular focus on low-paid workers to achieve better risk-sharing and to provide a greater flexibility for those who wish to retire on a phased basis. Now, that all sounds very good, but there's a couple of things that have happened that, that don't really inspire a lot of confidence in, in that statement. Um, First of all, the rollout of the, the old auto enrolment system, which is the mandatory pension system, has been delayed by four years due to um, economic circumstances. And estimates are that by virtue of doing this alone, people who would have been um, auto enrolled will, will lose 15% um, of, of a pension if they don't enroll, if they were going to be enrolled in, in, in 2014, but now not in 20, 2018. There's also no plans to standard rate tax reliefs. Um, however, this is included in the National Recovery Plan, but I think the, the tax reliefs are the biggest single source of inequity in, 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 in the pension, in pension policy. While, while there have been changes to thresholds, um, this is very good, it's, it's really just tweaking around the edges in terms of not actually biting the bullet on the, on the tax reliefs. We're also expecting to have an announcement tomorrow that um, there'll be a 0.5% levy on all private pension funds um, to fund the uh, the government's jobs initiative. However, what that will do is um, it will diminish already inadequate pension pension funds. When actually, what they should have been doing is allowing pension funds to be invested in in um, various strategic investment vehicles that, that to to facilitate recovery. I just want to talk about the just for a few minutes now, the, the pension model that we have developed with, with Trinity. And there's a couple of, of principles underpinning it. One is that it's universal, equitable, affordable, and, and secure. <coughs> there's a couple of elements to it. The first is that the, the state pension needs to be increased and universalized for, for everybody to provide a guaranteed basic income in, in retirement. And the second tier is based on an earnings-related social insurance system to provide the, the supplementary pension. I think Randy talked about that in, in, in his presentation. And we also set out how pension, pensions need to be rebalanced from private provision um, through the redistribution of tax reliefs um, to public. That the, the state needs to take a more active role in, um, in pension provision because, as we've seen, the, the current policy is expensive and it's not working. And also we have a couple of suggestions in relation to addressing the problems facing current members of occupational schemes which are in deficit. So first of all, the state pension. Um, as I highlighted earlier, the OECD in their most recent study on pensions, Ireland has the, um, the highest level of income inequality for, for, for people in retirement. So to have a, a basic income in place, you need to increase and universalise the state pension to 40% of, of um, gross average industrial earnings over a five year period. Now it's difficult to be putting, putting uh, points like that out in, in, in the current crisis, but in terms of look, um, that we need to look, have, a, have a, a vision of what kind of income support we need to have for, for people in retirement. This would eliminate pensioner poverty and provide a guaranteed income for, for everyone living in, in, in the country. The second tier is the the supplementary earnings related pension scheme and that would be managed through the social insurance fund and you would combine that with the state pension to give everyone um, 50 percent of their final salary up to a certain specified maximum because we have a problem with them um, with, with with some very high pensions from very uh, at the moment in terms of um, 
what usually gets 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 uh, um, reported is the is the the politicians' pensions. But we also have very very highly paid uh, public servants who get very, who also get very high pensions. And we recently had a uh, judge just making making representations to 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 the, the Taoiseach about about some of the difficulties they're going to face by having to pay more tax. So there's issues there in terms of um, pensions. So, but we, there needs to be a, they need to start from the the top, the bottom up in terms of having a, an adequate income for for everybody. It needs to be mandatory and defined benefit, and it needs to include credits for 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 um, home duties that to include caring responsibilities. Sure. Okay. Um, benefits of the social insurance process. A couple of things. It's low cost. The government policy has actually said that. Um, and the efficiencies can be gar can be um, garnered through economies of scale. It's it's, it's flexible, whether you're self-employed, an employee, or working in the home. Um, this system works. It's secure. It pools longevity mm -hmm. uh, and investment risk. And assuming you're sovereign, you've no solvency risks. Now, task is called for the government um, to conduct and, and publish a, a feasibility study to assess the viability of providing supplementary pension through a, the social insurance system. It's a system that's already in place. Um, and we don't see why not why it can't be explored as an option to, to provide the, the supplementary pension. Um, also, the state-led um, pension funds could be used for strategic investment purposes. I think Randy talked about in terms of building those bridges, building those schools, building those hospitals. It's, it's a fund that can be used for strategic investment purposes. In terms of rebalancing, um, there's, there's a lot of issues with the, with the, with the tax reliefs, and they, could, they should be used to, to fund reform and, de and more equitably de redistribute ec exchequer funding, spending on, on pensions. However, we all know any cuts in pension tax reliefs are going to be hoovered up by the deficit, so it's, it's difficult to make those arguments in the current context. However, the standards, it, pension tax reliefs have to be standard rated 20%. And as I said, there has been reductions in the ceilings. It's, it's, at the last budget, it was reduced from 150 to 115,000. We're still calling for that to reduce further to 75,000. And basically, at the end of the day, what we're, you know, the, um, subsidies should be removed from private pension provision, that the state provides the, um, um, the, pen, the pension, whether you're a private sector worker, public sector worker. And if you want to top that up, you go to the market, but you don't get subsidies for going to the market. Then finally, just to, there's a you know there's a, there's a lot of issues at the moment with um, pension funds in deficit, and we call for the introduction of a pension protection scheme for defined benefit and contribution schemes. Now, while there is a system in place, it's it's completely inadequate. And actually, the the you might be aware that the Waterford um, glass workers are taking the the state to, to court in Europe over the inadequacy of the of the protection. They've they've lost um, so much of their pensions. We've also suggested that the um, Companies Act be amended so that um, pension fund members should be top of the list of creditors um, before banks and shareholders when, when companies go into liquidation or get into difficulty. And then also there's a whole issue of, of, of regulation, that there needs to be more stringent requirements on, on pension providers in relation to managing risk, their charges and their fees. And every, every year the OECD does a survey of regulation of all their countries. and. Um, Ireland is one of the few countries that has no limits across all the various criteria in terms of managing risk. Like, for example, there's countries like Denmark, you have to um, invest 60% of your pension in, in, in government bonds. Um, and when you, when you do a, I did a back of the envelope exercise on looking at the, 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 the falls in value of pension fund, and you look at the regulation, the countries with the, the, with the stronger regulation didn't suffer as much in the financial crisis. So that concludes my, my, my presentation. I suppose what I want to just to, the final point is to say that um, the current policy is just tweaking at the sea at the, around the edges. It's not a fundamental change. Um, the policy we need a fundamental rethink of, of government policy um, for for pension provision to be to be addressed in a meaningful way. Thanks.